In this episode, the co-founder of MAPPA says that Chinese Dongwa could surpass Japanese anime in terms of popularity, Silver Veil, Veibei, and Nianers all leave Visojo in the same week, and we get a slew of anime film news. That, and much, much more. Behold, it's me, the CEO of SAO, or the resident PGS Transformers expert as proclaimed by Robert Meyer Burnett, or as most people know me, King Tanik. Hello and welcome to all my fellow weebs, otakus, imagination connoisseurs, and all of the members of the post-geek singularity to this episode of The Otaku Experience, the non-anime news show where we discuss the current goings-on in the anime and manga industry with our very uneducated opinions. Special thanks to Robert Meyer Burnett, all the great folks of the Burnett Network, and of course you, our viewers because without you the show would not be possible all right first of all welcome back hey i know we we didn't have a show last week and there's two reasons for that one uh rob was at CinemaCon, so the way that i do these episodes i film it in advance i edit it and then i send it to rob rob wasn't really in a position where he could you know put it up on youtube and present it in a way you know where in in, in based on where he was at he was very busy he was very tired he was doing a lot of stuff there and i I just wasn't going to be like, hey, and do this. You know what I mean? And then on top of that, uh, even if I wanted to do it, which I which I did want to do it, um, I was not feeling great when I usually record it. Like those two days that I have that chance to record, Tuesday night or Wednesday night, those are my only two chances to record. I did not feel good at all. And so I was like, Rob, <laughs> I can't do it this week. And he was like, it's okay, man. I'm at CinemaCon. Chill out. Or I guess he was like, hey, it's okay, man. D did I mention Star Trek? Anyways, I kid, I kid, I kid. Or do I? Okay. So anyways, welcome back to the Otaku Experience. Welcome actually to Core 2 of the Otaku Experience. If you don't know what that means, in the anime uh, community, usually when an anime season airs, they air in what are called cores. And a core is that seasonal period, that 12-week window. And so usually an anime core is 12 to 13 episodes. We just passed episode 12. We're now in episode 13. So technically speaking, we're now in Core 13. It's in semantics things. It means absolutely nothing to the overall show, but it's just funny. To think about. Okay, so there's actually a lot of news this week. Um, and believe it or not, none of this news is actually from the previous week. All of this is this week's news. That's just how busy this week was, which was funny because it could have been because of CinemaCon, but last week was a dead news week. So it's kind of good that I didn't do an Otago experience because it would have been a big old nothing burger of news. Okay, so, uh, but this week we got a lot. So let's just get right into it. There's no cute segue or nothing. I'm tired. Let's just get into it. Okay, great. Welcome back. Hello. Good to see you. You look nice. Okay. No, did you do something new with your hair? Okay. Anyways, sorry. Okay. Uh, Oshinoko, the, the opening of Oshinoko, the song, has surpassed 100 million views across all platforms. In an article, they said, uh, the first times news confirmed today that the cumulative total worldwide stream and video views for Yasobi's Idol, the opening se uh, theme for the spring 2023 TV anime Oshinoko, has reached 100 million views in just two weeks. And honestly, I don't know what we were expecting. This, this should not come as a shock to anyone who's been following this story. Oshinoko is just, it's a beast. It's, a, it's once, it's one of those once in a year anime that just, takes over, right? So last year it was Chainsaw Man, and then this year it's Oshinoko. Last year it was, or not last year, but the year before it would have been um, Jujutsu Kaisen, right? There's always an anime that literally just takes hold of everybody, and then we're all just captive to it. I think it's safe to say that we've already found what's probably going to be anime of the year, unless they completely squander it in a uh, in the final few episodes here. I'm I'm personally enjoying Oshinoko. Um, I, I know we, we may have talked about it a little bit before, but I thought the first episode was just okay. Uh, my biggest thing was that it was so long. And I went into it being like, wow. Like we did a whole segment on uh, the week before it aired when they were like, yeah, it's going to have a 90 minute premiere. And I was like, oh my gosh, can more anime do this? Please, for the love of God. And then I watched it and I was like, this did not need to be 90 minutes. I was like, this is a 45 minute episode that's just double the length for no reason, whether that's to be completely accurate to the manga or whatever. Uh, I Personally, it just didn't resonate with me. And I 
I was able to predict everything that happened in it. And that doesn't mean, because I predicted, you know, the big twist in Suzume. But that doesn't mean uh, that simply because I predicted what was going to happen by the end of Oshinoko. It's been a, it's been like a month now. So if, if if you care, you've seen it by now. But Ai's death, Ai getting stabbed to death by her stalker in front of her kids uh, and dying. I, I, I saw that coming a mile away. And the way they did it, because you can still do something with the execution properly where it still can resonate with me. Like, even though I predicted what was going to happen in Suzume, that when it happened, I was still like, oh my gosh, ah, the tears. In Oshinoko, when it happened, I was like, yeah, I knew this was coming. Um, not that it was like bad or anything anyway, but it just didn't resonate with me. And so then it, it kind of felt like I spent 90 minutes just kind of like, yeah, I know what we're getting to. Can we get to it? And then when they finally got to it, it was kind of underwhelming a little bit, I guess. Then the second episode hit, and I thought the second episode was uh, probably worse than the first. Um, not none of the episodes have been bad. I've enjoyed every episode so far, but it, it was probably just a just because I felt like it was a lot more of a setup episode. It was like, okay, time skip. Here's what you need to know. Okay, and then the third episode, the plot gets really good. And the third episode, I love Kana is my favorite character, and I'm a huge Oshinoko fan. So that, <laughs> that's that's it. That's the whole character arc. I know it's great, but getting back to the main topic, um, I mean, what did we expect from this? This is. Like I said, this is going to be the anime of the year. Whether or not this actually wins anime of the year at the awards, I think it's safe to say that this is going to be the anime of the year. Almost like how Top Gun Maverick didn't win Best Picture, but that is the movie of 2022, right? Like when you think of 20, either that or Avatar The Way of Water, but when you think of 2022, you're like, oh yeah, it's Top Gun Maverick. When we think of uh, 2022 in terms of anime, we'll be like, oh, Chainsaw Man. When we think of 2023 in terms of anime, we'll think Oshinoko. And so I, I think that this is, this should not be a surprise to anyone. I, I tried to look for um, like how this compares, like what are the most listened to openings of all time? Uh, and then like see how this compared to those like within a, a certain time period. And I couldn't really find anything on that. If you know anything about that, please let me know. But staying in the Oshinoko trend, uh, we have some news, uh, or I guess not, I guess it's not necessarily news, but we have new information uh, from an interview with the creator of Oshinoko, uh, Akasaka. And uh, I believe it was at a panel, uh, an audience uh, member, a fan asked if uh, Ai's death in the first episode, or if you read it in the manga, in the manga, if that was always planned from the get go. Um, and his answer was actually pretty interesting to me because I, because it, it happens in the first episode, it happens so early on in the show, and it's the entire catalyst that I was like, well, of course it had to have been planned. But his answer was actually pretty interesting and surprised me a little bit. He said, um, when asked if the shocking climax of volume one in which I is fatally stabbed by an obsessed fan and slowly dies in front of her children was actually planned, Akasaka admitted that this wasn't the case. Actually, this was an idea that was born during the serialization, Akasaka said. At first, it was planned that I and the children would be active in the entertainment world for quite a long time. But when I actually started drawing, I was too strong for a manga character. Now, he goes on, uh, they, they, they kind of elaborate more as, as the article covering the thing, covering the, the, um, the panel goes down in his answer. And, and he kind of elaborates that, that what he meant was as, uh, he, he kind of intended I to be like a supporting character. Um, and, and he didn't really give like a super concrete answer as to what, uh, at least from what I've seen, he didn't give a super concrete answer as to what it would have been like. It's just like, oh yeah, I wasn't originally intended to die in that way. Whether she still dies or whether she stays on for as, as a supporting character or a main period of time, whatever. So there's fa been fan theories now that, well, maybe uh, she would have gotten stabbed, but since um, Aqua in his previous life was a doctor, that he would be able to patch her up and keep her alive. And then she'd be like a supporting character. But then Akasaka saying that when he saw the, that I was overtaking uh, the main characters that he wanted to focus on, which was Aqua and, um, uh, what is it? Ruby, the, the, the sister, uh, that he had to take her out because she was not going to, he, he was, he wanted to focus on two different characters and a character that he wasn't focusing on. That was the one that caught the heart of the audience. And I think we've seen that in the anime sphere too. When, when that first episode aired, like literally for the past month now, it's been all eye fan art. It's ridiculous. It's all on my feet. I can't unsee it. And so 
I, I mean, it, it's it's kind of interesting. Now, obviously, this isn't really like a, a story. Like, this isn't really like um, this really has no bearing on anything. I just thought it was really interesting because usually when something that integral to what the plot is, like when you watch Oshinoko, or I assume when you read it, I haven't read it, but I assume when you read it, it feels like this is what we were building up to. This feels so natural. Like I said, I was able to predict what was going to happen. Um, it felt so natural. And, and and it was the entire catalyst of the show moving forward. It's how the plot gets kicked off. It's it, it's how Aqua's character arc gets kicked off. Then I'm like, well, how would the show have gone about it? Or how would the manga have gone about it if she didn't die, if she stayed alive the entire time? I think that's really interesting. And maybe we'll get uh, deeper and better answers for that as time goes on. Or maybe we won't. All right, so moving right along to the biggest part of this episode, which is the movie stuff. We got a ton of anime movie stuff this week for no reason. It was like, I was like, wow. Like, I was going through the, the stories and I was like, there is a lot of, like, anime movie announcements, um, which was very interesting. So starting out, uh, before we go into the anime movies to come, let's talk about the anime movies that are in theaters right now, starting with our favorite anime movie, Mario. I kid, it's not an anime movie, but it is, uh, Nintendo is a Japanese company, so I view this as kind of anime adjacent, so I kind of want to talk about it. So Mario, or the Super Mario Brothers movie, if you want to be more specific, um, has officially hit $1 billion at the box office. I predicted it, and, uh, yeah, very happy about this. It, uh, I've seen it twice. I'm in love with Princess Peach. Marry me. Um, I, I I think it was a really fun movie. It's really, I I hear people going like, "Oh, the story's kind of weak." I was like, "What are you talking about? Like, what did you what did you want from this? Did you expect like freaking I don't know Dune Part One out of this? Like, what did you want? Uh, I don't I don't really know what those people are saying. Like, it's a Mario. Movie. It's it's the exact plot you should have expected it to be. Like, hey, Bowser's coming to destroy everything. We got to stop him. That's it. Like, it's, I, I don't know. That was just really weird to me. But um, it has officially crossed $1 billion. At the time of recording this, it is at $1.056 billion, according to the numbers. And um, obviously, I think this is deserved. I thought this, shut up, phone. That's my phone telling me to go to bed. <laughs> Woo. Um, and it's, it's like 9.30. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Jesus is with me. We'll be okay. I'll survive another week of no sleep. But um, I, I think obviously, and, and we're not a video game channel, so I'll, I'll try not to, to get too involved in this. But I think that this does bode well for uh, video game adaptations moving forward. Um, and, and it's very exciting to see that there's been great critic response. There's been great audience response. And now it's the first billion dollar film of the year. It's, it's, it's showing no signs of stopping. It's been having amazing holds, like 30% holds every weekend. And, um, Guardians of the Galaxy comes out, uh, this weekend. So we'll see, uh, how that uh, affects Mario and if Mario's still able to keep its audience going against Guardians or if Guardians gonna suck all that away. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the weekend box office looks like. And you can bet your sweet bippy that we will have an update here for that. Okay. So then, uh, an actual anime film, uh, and my favorite film of the year so far, Suzume. Uh, so Suzume, is uh, basically done with its American run. Uh, I think today, the day I'm filming it, Wednesday this week, uh, I think was the final day of its, basically its wide release. Um, and now I think it's either going to be in very few theaters or it's completely done in America. I know it's not really playing anywhere near me because if I go and look up Suzume Showtimes, I don't get anything, um, which means that it's no longer playing within like a 30 mile radius from me, um, which is very sad because I did want to see it again, but never got a chance to. Um, so yeah, if you haven't seen it, I guess maybe you missed your, uh, maybe you missed your chance. I mean, if you're in Japan and uh, I guess we're, we're going to talk about that next, if you're in Japan, you still got uh, a little less than a month to go. But um, so Suzume, uh, whew, I'm, let me get a swig of water. Hang on guys. I'm not even going to cut this out. This is, this is, I'm being hot. I'm being humble, open, and transparent, okay? I'm tired. Okay, great. Water, wake me up. Ooh, yeah. You know, your body's 75% water, so if you don't drink water, you're keeping your body away from energy. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Bro, if this is what it's like 15 minutes into the episode, I can only imagine when we're at like 60 minutes or like 80 minutes, and I'm like, I'll be like Rob on Midnight Music. I'll be like, so, so, you know, slurring my words. It'll be great. 
But um, so Susan May's current box office, it's going to have roughly around uh, $10 million in America. It, it only needs a few hundred thousand more to get there. Um, and so I think it can probably do that in the few theaters that it's still in in America. Um, it is now the highest grossing Shinkai film in America, uh, which is nice. Uh, it's about two million ahead of uh, or by the end of its run. Once it hits that 10 million, it'll be 2 million ahead of uh, Weathering With You's domestic box office, which is at 8 million. Uh, So that's really fun to see. Uh, And its worldwide total, uh, as of filming this, is $319 million, basically 320. uh, And that leaves it within a 30 million window of your name. So it's 30 million behind your name. So we could have done it. We didn't do it, but uh, it, it's basically out of steam. It's it's not. It has no chance of getting to that thirty million, um, and it's now one hundred and thirty million ahead of Weathering with You and the global worldwide box office, which is very sad to see because, um, as you guys know, Weathering with You is my favorite Shinkai film, and so I kind of wish that that got you know more love from everybody, but it's okay. Uh, I mean, it, you know, one thing I never got was that how like. Uh, how controversial Weathering With You is. Like a lot of people loathe the ending of Weathering With You. Like the choice that Hodaka and Hina make. I'm not going to say what it is. But the, the choice that's made at the end, a lot of people hate it. And I'm like, bro, that's the best part of the movie. Okay, sorry. But um, yeah, so Susan May doing very well. It's going to finish right at uh, the number four spot in terms of the overall um, – ranking of worldwide box office for anime films right behind uh demon slayer mukin train i believe is number one spirited away your name suzume and then which we'll talk about in a second the first slam dunk is now number five um and so speaking of suzume and we, we mentioned this a couple minutes ago uh suzume is ending its theatrical run on may 27th in japan uh and so currently it is uh 1 30 uh, a little over $130 million in Japan. And so it's probably going to finish off around $135 million because they're starting to like do this like, this is your last chance to see it in theaters campaign, you know, in Japan. And so I assume that that's going to drive some more people to see it. And, uh, you know, could you imagine if it made $130 million in America? That would have been so cool. That would have been so cool. We can't have nice things. Um, we're in the end times. <laughs> Anyways. Um but yeah, so uh, I mean, I don't think this really affects anyone that watches this show, unless you're in Japan. Say what's up. But um, yeah, uh, it, it's ending. It's I think once that ends, it's probably officially done in theaters, and then we can look at the box office total. But it's probably if it if it makes a couple more million dollars in Japan, we can see this being around maybe the three twenty three mark worldwide. Uh, but it's probably it's it's not moving from the number four spot. All of the records that it's broken are going to stay there, and I don't think it has any more records to break. Um, uh, keeping with the anime uh, box office uh, trend going, um, we have the number five anime uh, box office film of all time is now the first slam dunk, which we have been talking about uh, for the past few weeks on this show uh, because it's getting its North American release later this summer. And um, I'm, I'm excited to see it. Uh, and it is now the number five box office anime film of all time with $251.52 million. And uh, I was actually surprised. Like, I, I kept seeing it break records, but I, I don't think I ever looked into what the actual box office was that it was making. And then I looked into this. I was like, oh, it's number five. What's that at? Oh, what? 250? It was uh, it was really surprising to me. But uh, I mean, from everything I know, I, I hear it's good and I hear that it, it's fun. I think it looks really cool uh, just from a visual standpoint, forgetting even the synopsis. Um, but I also, I'm interested by the synopsis as well. Um, so this is going to be really interesting to see how this, it's not going to do well in America at all. Just so you know, this is, this is not going to do well. I, I predict maybe $1 million opening weekend. So about on par with Sword Art Online, Scares of Deep Night. <sighs> but it's, um, I, I, Scarzo. What a disappointment. Okay. So so that's that that does it for the anime box office news for this week. So with the anime films that have that have left to uh come uh this this uh this year and, and in the future, we have a new anime film from PA Works. It's an original film. And uh PA Works, if you don't know, they've they've their most recent big hit would have been uh Buddy Daddies. Um, which I loved, I thought was great. They did Aquatope on White Sand, which I love that first half. That second half I thought was kind of eh. uh, Skip and Loafer, which is airing right now, and then probably their most popular show they've ever done, which is an adaptation of Angel Beats, um, which is on a lot of people's favorite anime lists, um, including my own. I love Angel Beats. Angel Beats is great. If 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 you've never seen 
Um, if you're looking for more anime to get into, like if this is your first time watching the show and you're like, I've never seen this anumai that you're talking about, you know, that's probably a good one to check out along with other ones like Death Note or, um, you know, Naruto or Bleach, you know, those types of shows. Um, and so we do have a little synopsis. I thought uh, with this being PA Works, one, they're really good at original uh, works in terms of storytelling. They've been good at it forever. Like this is kind of like their brand. I mean, they do anime adaptations, but their brand is kind of like we're an original studio. We only do originals, which is great because they've kind of developed a thing where usually when an anime studio does an original film or an original series, it doesn't really perform all that great. But when PA Works does it, you can almost guarantee that it's going to have some kind of an audience because PA Works has kind of defined themselves as that. And so we did get a trailer, a little teaser, like 30 second thing. Half of it was like, hey, remember what we've done in the past? And it, it got me to be like, oh, OK, I'm excited now. But uh, so I guess it worked. But um, I, I think that this is obviously because it's PA Works, it's going to look beautiful. It's going to look stunning. The music's going to be great. It's going to be very emotional. Um, and I, I'm, I'm very excited to see it. So here's a little bit of a synopsis for uh, A Whiskey Family. I don't know if I ever said the title. A Whiskey Family is the title. Kotaro visits Komeda Distillery for a project on a Japanese craft whiskey. Led by a young female president, Rui, who took over the family business, the distillery works hard to reproduce its signature whiskey, Koma, which they had to stop making years ago. However, not to mention financial backing, too many clues are missing to revive the once lost whiskey. So, I mean, that synopsis doesn't really, it doesn't do a great job selling the movie. Um, but it's also, we're we're still in early stages of the production, so I'm hopefully that we'll get something better later on. I'm I'm interested because it's PA Works. And PA Works, uh, that, sure, there have been times like with Aquatope where I've been underwhelmed, but I've ne they've never made anything bad, at least that I've seen. Not saying that they've never made anything bad, but I've never watched something they've made that's been bad. And so every experience I've had with them has been good. And so... This bodes well for me. I'm excited to see it, and I'll be there in theaters day one. Okay, another thing that um, another uh, a thing that we we actually haven't gotten any looks at this yet, uh, but we will be getting a first look at Annecy uh, 2023. Did I say that right? Annecy, I think so. Uh, which is in June, and that is the Lord of the Rings anime film that they announced uh, back when. Um, uh, you know, remember that a couple years ago when they were like, yeah, we're going to do an anime film. We're going to do all this stuff like, you know, uh, it, you know, all these prequels and da, 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 da. And we were like, oh, that's sick. Um, so we're finally going to get a first look at it at Annecy 2023, which is in June. So I assume we'll probably get our first look at maybe a poster, maybe a, a quick teaser or something, which is really exciting to see. So in an article, they said, well, ahead of the planned theatrical opening on April 12, 2024, Kenji Kamiyama's The Lord of the Rings, The War of Rohirrim film has its has set its eyes uh, on a premiere date at France's Annecy Film Festival. As producer Jason DeMarco confirmed on Twitter, the film's Annecy debut is lined up for June 2023. And then they give a little synopsis of the film that says Lord of the Rings, uh, The War of Rohirrim is set 183 years before the events of the depicted uh, before the events depicted in the original The Lord of the Rings trilogy. Helm and the people of what will later become known as Helm's Deep must take a daring last stand when the Dundling Lord Wolf launches a sudden attack. Can Helm's daughter Hera find the strength to lead the resistance against this deadly foe? Ba ba bum. I think this sounds awesome. And it's anime. I mean, we already saw what happens when you combine anime and Star Wars with Star Wars Visions, which was amazing. Which, uh, by the way, Volume 2 comes out the same day that this episode is airing. And so next week, we'll be talking about Star Wars Visions, which is going to be, I'm super excited to see that. But uh, we saw how that happened, and that was amazing. So I'm so excited to see anime and Lord of the Rings. Oh, dude, it's going to be so awesome. Uh, we really don't have much else. Like, that's that's kind of like the main, that's, that's it. Like, there's nothing really to speculate about. Like, wait till we get a trailer. We'll talk some more then. Okay, so just wait till June. There you go. There's your Lord of the Rings news for the for the next few months. Okay. Uh, then, uh, on top of that, a film we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago, Lonely Castle in the Mirror, is also going to... Um, Annecy 2023. Uh, and I believe that they're actually just going to be doing their uh, American pr premiere in uh, there. And then after that, or not necessarily the American premiere, but they'll be doing a premiere of it. Um, and then after that, we'll start to see its uh, 
released later in the summer like we we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. And so if you guys forgot, or if uh, this is your first episode of the Otaku Experience, hello, welcome, um, and you don't know what the Lonely Castle in the Mirror is, uh, here's a quick synopsis for that. Shy outcast uh, Kokoro has been avoiding school for weeks when she discovers a portal in her bedroom mirror. She reaches through and finds herself transported to an enchanting castle where she is joined by six other students. When a girl in a wolf mask uh, explains that they have been invited to a To play a game, the teens must work together to uncover the mysterious connection that unites them. However, anyone who breaks the rules will be eaten by a wolf. It sounds interesting, and I'm super excited to see what that um, uh, what that looks like. I mean, I mean, we know what it like looks like, but like how the final product looks like. Does that make sense? Okay. Anyways, I'm moving on. I don't care if that makes sense. Okay. So the they're they're doing a street fighter movie i don't know if you heard the capcom game the fighting game they're doing a street fighter movie and um they're have they're having talks about who's going to direct it which are the filippo brothers and if you don't know who they are don't worry i didn't know who they were either so these these guys have uh they've directed a uh uh a horror film that that debuted at the Adelaide Film Festival in October 2022 called Talk to Me. And apparently it was really good and it was really cool. I didn't see it, but apparently it was cool. And then uh, they've also been running a the YouTube channel uh, Raka Raka, which is an anime or an, an, an amateur horror comedy uh, YouTube channel. Now, I don't, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, but I guess... With something like this, I would have been like, wouldn't you want to have like someone who's like more experienced in that arena? Now, what I've heard from people who are defending this is like, well, hey, maybe they want more of maybe they're honing in on on certain elements that are right up these guys alley um, and focusing more on the the violent side of it. And I was like, OK, that could be interesting. But sadly, I haven't seen anything that these guys have done. I haven't watched a single YouTube video of them. Uh, and so I, I, I just don't know. And so it kind of scares me, but Hey, maybe, maybe they saw something in them. Like I said, they, they, they went to a film festival with their horror film. Talk to me. It got uh, great acclaim. And so maybe, 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 I mean, that's really, I don't, I can't really commentate on it because I, I don't know who they are. Okay. Then the last bit of anime film news uh, this week, and it's not really anime, it's anime adjacent, and that is Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, some people call it anime, some people don't. I don't think it's an anime, but it's anime inspired. It's, it takes a lot of its cues from anime, so we'll talk about it here. And so the uh, Avatar The Last Airbender film, the, the animated film that they're doing, not the live action Netflix adaptation, uh, not the series that they're doing on Netflix, but the uh, animated film that they're doing in 2025 has an official release date. And uh, this came out at uh, CinemaCon. So Paramount confirmed the upcoming Avatar The Last Airbender release date at CinemaCon 2023 while, t- while teasing some updated designs. An image of the film revealed the ov- older gang in their 20s and 30s. Standing in front of a snowy mountain, while not much was gleaned from the picture, Zuko will seemingly sport a long ponytail, an update on the traditional Fire Nation style seen throughout the show. Uh, the new animated feature will release on October 10th, 2025. So we got a ways to go. So like, I would, I'd be like, bro, don't even promote this to me. Don't even remind me that it's this far away. If, if you guys don't know, Avatar The Last Airbender is my favorite series of all time. Um, in, in terms of like, uh, American TV shows. If I, if I, sorry, I'm messing with magnets. I'm fidgeting. I'm fidgeting. Woo. This is the worst episode I've ever filmed. Okay. So, um, but, but it's, it's so far off that I'm like, just just don't even tell me about it. Just don't even, because I know it's all going to be amazing. So don't even tease me this far out, okay? You want to talk to me like mid-2024? Sure, maybe. Maybe we could talk about that. But maybe late 2024 is when I would start being like, okay, here's the news. Don't talk to me this early, because now I'm just getting excited for something that's over two years away, and I'm so sad. But um, they, I cannot sadly, I sadly cannot show the image that they're talking about. I've seen the image, but everyone who is uploaded a video or posted on Twitter or whatever, and the image was there, that has been taken down. And I don't want to get this episode taken down. So we're just not even going to see it. If you look it up, maybe you can find it yourself. Um, But I, I, I cannot, uh, I cannot risk that. So sorry about that. And uh, yeah, that's all the anime movie news for this week. All right. So we got some manga news this week and only uh, two major stories. 
Um, and one is, uh, Aharon san wa hakaranai has ended. Uh, so in an article, they said, the Aharon san wa hakaranai. I know you're tired, but you can't mess this up. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Sometimes I got to do that to myself. You know, it's, it's okay. Just a little pep talk. Okay. Okay. The Aharon san wa hakaranai manga has officially ended with the 167th chapter. The latest chapter was recently published in Shueisha's Shonen Jump Plus magazine. In total, the manga will have 17 episodes. The author, Asato Mizu, posted a commemorative illustration of the announcement on her Twitter, thanking fans for all the support. You know, it's funny, I, I get tired and suddenly my brain can't even read. Like, it can, I can't even read a romanji. Like, it's written out for me in English. Like, Aharan-san wa hakaranai. Why can't I read that? Like, it'd be one thing if I was trying to read the Japanese characters and I'm tired and I'd be like, what does that say? But it's written out, Israel. Okay, sorry. Sorry. I'm not even going to edit this out. Okay, this is this is, this is is making the show better. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, I mean, look, I never read the manga and I never watched the show, but it did get a very popular anime adaptation uh, recently. And... Um, I know that people liked it. I know that a lot of people watched it. I didn't watch it myself just because there's only so many anime I can watch in an anime season. But uh, maybe this means that we'll get another season of the show where maybe I'll just have to go and check out the manga for myself. For those of you guys that maybe have never heard of it or have heard of it but don't know what it's about, here's a quick synopsis of the manga and or the anime. Uh, socially awkward, Aharon san has personal boundary issues, either getting too close or too far from her classmates. When fellow student Raido uh, picks up an eraser she drops, Aharon san decides they are now best friends. Whether studying, playing the arcade, or just eating lunch, she's along for the ride. What follows is an impromptu bonding that shows affection can blossom in the unlikeliest of places. And like I said, it's a back! And, um, or I guess it's it's not back. Sorry, it's over. But um, <laughs> I'm so tired. No, but um, listen, I I think it sounds cute. The 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 thing, the main thing that's holding me back, and I'm sure you guys have heard this before. Is we say this every week because it's true. <laughs> There's so much I have to cover and watch and read and talk about, and I got to write scripts and I got to make videos and then I got to make the otago spread. There's just so much that it's hard to find time to to actually do these things like it's almost like especially with manga i have to cycle one out so once i finish girlfriend girlfriend once girlfriend girlfriend ends sadly it's ending but once it ends i will cycle it out and then we can filter another manga in there it'll probably be one piece again well no i'm already reading one piece but um maybe maybe i can filter this in there there's there's just a lot i gotta read uh okay then the next uh piece of manga news is that uh so Aharon Senwa Hakaranai is ended and then a show that's coming back or a manga that's coming back is the demon girl next door uh I almost said the demon girl next door returns that was the headline that I wrote that I was reading I was like <laughs> this is so bad it's okay um all right so uh so the author went on hiatus in October due to some health conditions uh, they're all better now, and uh, the manga is coming back. So glad that they're feeling better and glad that this manga is coming back for all those whippersnappers who really like this stuff. For, for those of you guys that don't know what this is about, uh, here is a quick synopsis. One morning, 15-year-old Yoshida Yuko wakes up to discover she has sprouted demon horns and a tail. Not only that, she learns from her mom that she has supernatural powers and an important mission, to restore her family's glory by defeating the local magical girl. The magical girl in question is Chiyoda Momo, a student at Yuko's school. With strength that is only mediocre at best, Yuko's task to vanish Momo will prove more challenging than she realizes in this topsy-turvy magical girl comedy. Bum, bum, bum. I, I think it sounds pretty uh, pretty cute. Um, I probably will never read it, but that's okay. Okay? All right. All right, so getting over to the industry news. So here's the news that takes place in the manga and anime industry and everything related to that. So in the VTuber industry, uh, we have uh, Silvervale, Vebe, and Yanners all leaving Visojo in the same week. And so Basically, it's it's not like some big drama. It's just their contracts came up, um, and then they all decided to not uh, continue. They're just going to um, 
Uh, they're going to retain their models and other assets as part of their intellectual proper properties or IPs. And uh, they're just going to continue on their own way. They release statements. Both parties release statements. Visoja release statements and all three uh, VTubers release statements. And um, and uh, it was it was it was sad to see. I mean, I don't know how sad it is necessarily. I mean, it, it's almost like with with the Visoja thing, it's, it's just it's almost like a your backbone. And so I, I feel like the only thing that's like why I'm kind of okay with this is because, and I, I, I enjoy watching uh, Vebe and Neander's. I don't think I've ever seen a Silver Veil thing. Maybe I have to check that out. But I, I've seen Vebe and Neander's and I also watch Iron Mouse. They're all great. But um, is that V Sojo was this, um, almost like this propeller, this backbone. And, and so I'm fine with it because they're all big enough to support themselves now. Whereas before they kind of needed that to help keep them afloat like hey we're we're now a part of this company a part of this uh this agency this brand along with other people that are associated with us and that'll kind of help us grow but now that they're there and the contracts are up they're like hey we're gonna go our own way and Visoja was like all right we're sad to see you go but uh we love you and they were like we love you too and uh, just love all around. There was no drama here or anything like that. Um, maybe a little disappointing for all the scoopers who were like, you never guess what I heard. But I don't know. It's nice. It's okay. It, I mean, I mean, it's not like their content's going anywhere. It's not like they, they'll stop streaming on Twitch or whatever. But uh, anyways, yeah, it's fine. All right. Then we had, uh, along with people leaving their agencies, we had Hina Sugata, who played uh, Marine Kitagawa most recently, or maybe not most recently, but... Um, most popularly in the common, in your brain. Oh, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, so she left her agency and she now becomes a freelancer. And she released a statement uh, breaking the news to all of her fans. And she said, to all of you who have always supported me and to everyone uh, concerned, I, Hina Sugita, uh, would like to announce that I left Amino Produce Inc. as of April 30th, 2023. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to everyone at the agency who patiently watched over me, who wanted to become a voice actor and supported me, who did not know anything about voice acting. I will continue to work as a freelance actor with the same determination to keep moving toward new goals that you have taught me. I would like to thank you all for your support, and I will devote myself to becoming an actor who can make your days more colorful and your hearts more exciting. Thank you for your continued support and guidance. That's such a my hard smile. Like, why? She didn't have to say it like that she could have just been like hey uh you know just just kept it very professional and very um just just straight up here are the facts bye but she was like i love y'all and i want to devote myself to making everybody happy and da, da, da. i was like man wow that's that's really authentic and the same thing with the other thing there's uh there's really no drama here it's just she had been she she had that backbone built up uh from from the um from the agency, kind of holding her up. And then when she got big enough, when she was like a baby who grew, and now she can walk on her own, she decided to go her own way. And uh, I don't know what that analogy was, but maybe it made sense. Maybe it didn't. Okay. Then we had, uh, that, that was mainly like the, the drama stuff out of the way. Um, well, actually, no, we have a little more drama thing down the way. That's, that's my brother texting me. Um, I'll text him back in a bit. Okay, so we had Bushi Road, which is an anime uh, uh, company. Uh, they are announced that they're creating a new company for new IP. So their Bushi Road announced last week that it is splitting its consolidated subsidiary Bushi Road Creative to establish a new company, uh, Bushi Road Works, in on July third. Bushi Road Works will be in charge of publishing new magazines and books, planning on operating comic websites and creating new intellectual property. And so this is honestly what I like to see. This is like PA Works, basically being like, yeah. We're going to create our own, um, you know, our own IPs, our own franchises, and it's going to be ours. So now we don't have to worry about the rights. We can have our own thing. We can have brands that are associated with us as a studio. I think it's very smart and uh, I like it. Once again, the, these stories are like, they're, they're like big enough for me to talk about, but there's not like, you know, there's not like major things yet like once we hear like what bushy road starts creating things like that we can talk a little bit more about that or once we know exactly where hina's going or where vebe and nyaners and silver veil are going then we can talk about that but really we have with with these past few stories we just really don't have a lot of news about where they're going after that we just have like hey we're going on this journey and then we're like oh yeah go or okay bad depending on uh how you view these issues 
All right, then next, and it's our um, it's sad news uh, for this episode, and that is Frank Agrama uh, has passed away. Um, and so the official, and I, once again, it's one of those things that um, I, I know, I know of things that he's worked on, but I, 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 I'm not like an expert. I don't, I don't want to speak about something I'm not super um, informed on, especially when it's something as serious as this. So I'll just, I'll just read almost verbatim what the article was saying. The official Twitter accounts for the Macross slash Robotech franchise revealed on Wednesday that Harmony Gold founder Frank Agrama passed away peacefully at his home with his family by his side on Wednesday. He was 93 years old. There will be a small service for the family. Uh, Agrama was born on January 1st, 1930 in Egypt. He studied medicine and surgery at the University of Cairo, and he became a medical doctor at 23 years old. He later received a Bachelor of Theater Arts degree at the University of California in Los Angeles. He moved back to the Middle East in 1964 to start up Lebanon's movie industry. With his, with his family, Agrama later relocated to Italy, where he founded the Film Associate, Association of Rome. He returned to the U.S. after nine years in Italy. Agrama founded Harmony Gold in 1983 and served as chairman and CEO. His company handled production, acquisition, and distribution of international television programming. He was an executive producer on the 1985 Robotech, or Macross, anime, and almost all of its sequel attempts. Uh, through Harmony Gold, he also served as an executive producer for this company's for the company's English dubs for Dragon Ball, Space Pirate, uh, Pirate, uh, Captain Harlock, and Once Upon a Time Anime. Harmony Gold USA also credits Agrama as one of the two screenplay writers of Robotech, the Shadow Chronicles sequel. So obviously I've heard of uh, Robotech. Everybody knows what Dragon Ball is. Um, and, and so we, we want to thank uh, Agrama for um, for his service to the anime community and to the anime industry. Uh, and just reading that, I was like, man, this guy's done a lot. It, seems, it sounds like he had a very full and fulfilling and i mean speaking about it now you know like seeing the the effects of everything he did you know with with um with with, with anime uh like like dragon ball or like robotech and now we can see like like those are some of the seeds that sprouted off into a lot of the bigger stuff that we're talking about now uh, we just want to say thank you frank agrama and we hope that you rest in peace all right then we had uh some mappa news uh and it's kind of like the biggest news story of the week. And that is that the MAPPA co-founder says that Dongwa, uh, Chinese animation basically, could surpass Japanese animation in terms of popularity. And, and a quote, and, I, you know, honestly, I heard about this and I was like, I, I mean, probably, yeah. I mean, eventually, yeah. I mean, sure. I, I think that Japanese animation has surpassed Western animation in terms of popularity, at least currently. It, it might be a trend. It might be a fad that then leaves. Um, but at least currently, that's that's the case. Um, and, and so this, this wouldn't surprise me, uh, and, 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 and everything he's about to say, I, I really agree with, uh, and I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. So what he said was the only reason China hasn't quite caught up with Japan yet is because a bunch of restrictions imposed on free expression there. Uh, Maru Yama said, if more freedom is unleashed, Japan will be overtaken in no time. While Japan does not possess the same creative restrictions, the co-founder believed Japan's focus on commercialism and cranking out money spinning genres such as starring those kawaii female characters has made it lose its spark of imagination. As a result, anime doesn't necessarily outshine the animated works um, Disney or France's art house produces in terms of creativity. Now, I agree with a lot of what he said there. Um, and then there's some things that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, I, one thing that I think he's spot on about is how the anime thing, and we talk about it all the time, it's the anime tropes, you know, like with Isekai. And he was talking about um, the uh, those kawaii female characters. And kawaii, if you don't know, kawaii is just cute um, or attractive, depending on how you use it in Japan. So, you know, like, oh, those attractive female characters, you know, they're they're usually over-sexualized, da 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 just to get people to to check out the anime and uh and and, and, he, and what he was kind of expressing there was that it's almost like anime has become so beholden to a lot of these tropes that made anime successful in the first place without having the ability to evolve creatively over time that they're still stuck in their way and i think we see a lot of this and this might just be me talking because i know a lot of people are still fans of this but I think we see this a lot in isekai. Isekai, which is the biggest anime genre, 
has become the most stale anime genre. It's all the same. Every isekai is the exact same, man. Every time. Like every time I do a video talking about, okay, here's the anime. I'm going to watch this next anime season. And I go through the list and I see isekai, 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 isekai. And I'm like, I don't want to watch these. And so unless it get like it, it, it becomes super popular and super different, um, like with Mushoku Tensei, I, I didn't think Mushoku Tensei was like necessarily great, but I really appreciated it because it was different. And it it kind of spun the tropes on their heads and it, it, it had fun with it um, rather than just being like, yeah, here's just, it, this is just what you do in anime. But I think he's right on the money with oftentimes that's what it feels like. Oh, this is what you do in anime. And and that's going to cost them, you know, once other other studios are able to, to, to kind of, if, if other places are more creative, as soon as they catch the attention of the audience, that's where the audience is going. Um, which is scary. And I, I, I love anime. I think that when, when anime, and I, obviously I think anime is overall a vast net positive for the, for the film fan community, for, for just, you know, the pop culture society in general. Um, and it, it, I mean, that kind of scares me a little bit in a way that's like, oh, that, but I love anime. But I got to say one of my favorite dongwa or one of my favorite, I guess if you want to call it anime of the past uh, two years was something called Link Click. It was an anime called Link Click. It was a series called Link Click that um, was a dongwa. It was a Japanese show or a, a Chinese show. And it was really, really good. It was really creative. And I was like, oh my gosh, how did they come up with this premise? This is really awesome. Um and, and and that type of creativity, one of my most anticipated movies for this year, and I don't even know if it's ever going to get an American release, is a is a Chinese animated film called Deep Sea. It looks stunning to me, and I want to watch it so badly, but uh, it's probably not ever going to be released in America in any wide capacity, so I will have to find other means to watch it. But um, yeah, uh, so what do you guys think? I think he has his finger on the pulse. Um, I, I think that... Uh, I think he's wrong about the uh, outshining uh, the animated works of Disney. Um, I haven't, I'll be honest, I haven't really seen a lot of Fran- France's um, animation work. So I, I, I can't really speak on that. But in terms of Disney, I think a lot of people would agree that Disney has become very stale in terms of uh, what they're doing. Um, I mean, because they're just, they're just turning everything that's animated into live action. <sighs> but, um, but I do think that he's right about just about everything else there. So what are your thoughts on that? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And hopefully, um, hopefully we can live in a world where we can have all of it, where we can have great popular anime. We can have great popular dog. We can have great popular Western shows, you know, all of it. Then we had um, uh, the final uh, thing and it's drama. Uh, so the Japanese artists are are claiming or are, are demanding protective laws from AI. Which is good. This is almost like what the the Writers Guild of America is doing right now uh, in terms of uh, the writer strike that is going on. Uh, and, and obviously, AI is just a, a part of it. But this is mainly to the AI. And so here's, here's this is interesting. Uh, according to an article from Anime Dork, 30 illustrators have demanded protective legislation to prevent AI from using their work without permission. The group formed in response to the general growth of AI in their industry over recent years, but also more specifically to the, de- to the development of the AI service Mimic, which was released in beta form by developers Radius 5 in 2002, or 2022. Uh, the similar style, uh, the technology allows users to upload art and receive AI-generated works of a similar style, which has opened the door for anyone to replicate an artist's work without asking or informing them. Uh, Japanese officials have stated that they plan to regulate AI's usage in the near future, but clearly the process isn't moving quickly enough for artists who have found their livelihood under threat from services like Mimic. And now this is clearly just talking about just Japanese artists in general, but I do know that there are a lot of animators who don't like this, who don't like the idea of, oh yeah, let's just use AI to create the animation. That idea scares people because it puts them out of a job and they don't want to do that. Um, And and I also think it just takes away the integrity of the work. Like the whole thing about art, and Rob's been talking about this at nauseum with AI, the whole thing about art is it's from a, a human's perspective. And you can't do that if it's an AI. And AI doesn't have a perspective unless I'm, I mean, unless it becomes like Ultron and it starts like becoming self-aware and asking itself important existential questions, stuff like that. But currently at the state we're at, it's in no position to do that. And so it's very scary. So I'm, I'm 
in alignment with the Japanese artists on this. They, they did say that Japanese officials uh, are planning to regulate AI's usage in the near future. But the near future ain't now. You need to do it now. Come on, guys. What are you waiting for? All right. So let's get into my favorite part of every episode of the Otaku Experience. Guac time. The goofy with the anime community. All right, so the first thing that happened is uh, a 59-foot Gundam is now entering a competition to play rock, paper, scissors against humans. What? <laughs> they, the AI have risen among us? No. Um, this is I, – I saw this. I was like, what? Like, they have, like, a whole, like, 60-foot AI – or not AI, a 60-foot Gundam. Like, it's one-to-one -one scale, and it's up in there, and it's like, yo, bro, let's play rock, paper, scissors. I was like, What? I don't know. That, I mean, it's kind of cool. Yeah, but, you know, I might have to say that's our certified goofy woofy, uh, a, a certified goofy moment, you know. But uh, then another thing that happened is uh, Pochita was at the Met Gala. And not really. Uh, someone did fan art of Pochita at the Met Gala, um, which was very, which was very cute. Uh, I thought it was very nice. I honestly, you know what? I'll be honest. I'll be 100%. I don't know what the Met Gala is, bro. All I know is that every year people be going to the Met Gala. Someone always falls at the Met Gala. Everybody's wearing these crazy things at the Met Gala. I don't know what the Met Gala is, but um, I don't really care either. Okay. And then the the final thing, which I think is really funny. It's probably not like, like you probably wouldn't hear about this and think, oh, that's goofy. I think it's goofy. So Full Metal Alchemist took back number one on my anime list. It took the number one spot back from Oshinoko, which took it when it debuted. And so now the top uh, five on my anime list looks like uh, 9.10 goes to Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, uh, 9.08 goes to Oshinoko, 9.8 goes to Attack on Titan, the final season, the final chapters, terrible title, uh, number uh, 9.8 uh, goes to Steins Gate, and a 9.07 goes to Bleach, Thousand Year, Blood War. And did I say 9.8 for Steins Gate? I meant 9.08. No, uh, you get what I'm trying to say. But uh, yeah, it, it's funny that like, Oshinoko, Attack on Titan, and Steins Gate are all like tied for like number two, which is really funny to me. But uh, Full Metal Alchemist, I mean, you got to think about it. Full Metal Alchemist was at like a 9.13, 9.12 before this whole Oshinoko debacle. And now it's at a 9.10. So that means Oshinoko fans are fighting back, which is funny. But I told you this it wasn't going to stick. They were going to, oh man, they like, like in Helm's Deep, man, they, they commenced war. All right, and for the last thing this week, as always, we have the audience ranking for the anime season, which we're currently in spring 2023. And so starting with um, anime trending, we have the top 10 anime of the week. Number one, first time being at number one, is Mobile Suit Gundam, The Witch for Mercury season two. And this went up uh, one spot to the number one spot for the first time. Apparently something really interesting happened with Ghoul, and um, I, I'm not caught up on this season at all. Oh, I've been super behind on this anime season as a whole. It's crazy. I've only kept up with like Oshinoko, Demon Slayer, and I've watched a bit of Tony Kawa. That's about it. But um, then at number two, went down one spot because Gum Gundam pushed it out. We have Hell's Paradise, which I started, and that is actually really solid. And I was like, wow, this is actually like, wow, I'm excited to continue this. Uh, so check out Hell's Paradise if you haven't already. Then at number three, we have Oshinoko, which has spent two weeks at number three now. Uh, it debuted at number four, and then it spent... Um, the next two weeks at, uh, at number three. Um, so this is week three. Uh, and so this is after the third episode. And, uh, I think, I think a lot of people are surprised that Oshinoko is like one of the highest rated anime on my anime list. It's, it's the highest rated anime on anime corner. Um, and then suddenly you go, you go to anime trending and it's number three. And, uh, personally, I don't mind it. I don't think Oshinoko is the greatest thing ever, but, uh, I, I mean, I like the show, but I do think that Hell's Paradise has been better so far. Uh, and so I don't mind that. But it's still at number three. So what more do you want? It's been in the top three for a while now. Um, then at number four, we have Tengoku Daimakyo, or Heavenly Delusion, which has spent two weeks at number four. Uh, at number five, we have Skip and Loafer, which moved up one spot into the top five. Um, I've heard that that show is remarkably cute, which is good because I wanted to check it out, but I was like, but what if it's like kind of mid? But luckily, it's looking like it's it's actually pretty solid. At number six, going up one spot, is Demon Slayer Kimetsu no Yaiba Swordsmith Village Arc. I have not seen this latest episode just yet, um, but I've been, honestly, I've been kind of like just okay with this season. It hasn't been like, oh, what? Like like the second season was. Uh, at number seven, it dropped down two spots to number seven, is My Love Story with Yamada-kun at level 999. Uh, two weeks at number eight is Insomniacs After School. 
Uh, and then two new entries at the bottom of the top 10. At number nine, we have The Dangerous in My Heart and Why Ray Liana Ended Up at the Duke's Mansion. Two anime that are on my watch list that I just have yet to start. Moving over to the anime uh, corner uh, ranking, we have they're at week four, so they're a week ahead. So they're including this week's um, uh, episodes. Uh, and so we have at number one is Oshinoko, which is at the same rank. And I believe it's been here the entire anime season on Anime Corner. So that's just the dichotomy between different anime fans. It's, you, go to, you go to one website and the anime fans can vote one way and you go to another and they can vote in a totally different way. At number two, we have Hell's Paradise, uh, which moved up three spots from rank number five. And that got 7.6% of the vote. Uh, Oshinoko got 7.67% of the vote. Uh, at number three, which dropped uh, one spot from rank two down to number three, is Demon Slayer Swordsmith Village Arc. Got 7.48% of the vote. Uh, number four uh, stayed at the same rank is Masho Magic and Muscles, which I'm so excited to start. And it got 5.47% of the vote. Uh, moving up seven spots from rank 12 is Vinland Saga Season 2 at number five, and it got 4.46% of the vote. Uh, at number six, which moved up 15 spots from rank 21, um, is at Kamikaze, is, uh, Kamikatsu Working for a God in a Godless World, um, which... Honestly, I I don't think I'm – besides like, you know, reading the synopsis and deciding whether or not I was going to watch it, I don't think I've heard anything about this. So maybe this bodes well that I should actually go and check this anime out. And that got 4.28% uh, of the vote. Um, at number seven, uh, which went down four spots, is Loving Yamada-kun at level 999. And that got 3.98% of the vote. Um, going up six spots from number 14, at number eight is The Dangers in My Heart. Um, and, and this happened uh, – with the uh, anime trending list and now the anime corner. So I guess this episode, I guess, I guess whatever episode this was, this was must have been like a, a banger episode because it went up really high up for both of them. And that got 3.8% of the vote. At number nine, going down three spots from rank number six is Dr. Stone New World, and that got 3.48% of the vote. And at number 10, Legendary Hero is Dead, which went up 17 spots to uh, from rank 27 and got 3. Uh, one five percent of the vote is the legendary hero is dead and that's what that looks like for the anime quarter rankings and guys that's gonna do it for this episode of the otaku experience it's good to be back uh let's hope that these next 12 to 13 episodes can be a really fun time for this next core before we go into core three and the summer anime season uh as always uh make sure you check out um you know, the, the other shows on the Burr Network, you know, we have k PGS, we have Rob Observations, we have Midnight Musings, we have Ladies of the PGS, um, we have uh, the new show with Lana, we have the Architects of Imagination, uh, and we have the Otaku Experience. I'm sorry if I'm forgetting anything else. The, this, the Burr Network is expanding at such a rapid pace, and it's very exciting to see. Uh, as as well, you can also subscribe to me on YouTube at King Tannic. You can follow me on Twitter at King Tannic Israel. You can follow me on Instagram at King Tannic. Um, and you can also find me here every week on Thursdays, except for last week, but every week on Thursdays right here on the Burnett Network. With that being said, guys, I will see you guys next week.